All right, good morning. Chapter 7, we're at it. Not much time left before we're going to be hitting 7, then 8, and then the next exam. Some of you have already gone online and saw the exam review uh, example problems that I have out there. It is timed, so if you start it, you got to finish it. Um, and then you can go back and redo it as many times as you want. Uh, but for today, we're going to start with a review question as well. So in your groups, take a moment, write this down, and see if you can solve that. Use any method you want. You can use the quadratic formula. You can use factoring. Um, you can use factor by grouping. Um, I mean, honestly, if you wanted to graph it and try to figure it out, you could, although that would be the least time. Uh, it would be the most amount of time, so this is the least efficient method. So give that one a try. So after we get AC, procedurally, what we've done is we're looking for numbers that multiply to negative 12, which, I mean, I already have two of them. I had uh, 2 times negative 12. All right. And then we're looking for, so this is the, they multiply. And then I want to know what they add up to, their sum. So 2 and negative 12 multiply to negative 24. They add to negative 10. And then I start listing all the other ones because my target is negative 5. I want them to multiply to negative 4 and add to negative 5. But we can start thinking, what other numbers multiply to 24? You know, negative 6 times 4 it multiplies to negative 24 and it adds to negative 2. Since it wants to add to negative 5, when I'm doing these, like I could then do 6 and negative 4, but I'm not going to write it down because 6 and negative 4 will add to a positive 2. And I need it to add to a negative. So when I'm doing this, multiplying to a negative, there one's positive, one's negative. The negative one has to be the bigger one. What other numbers multiply to negative 12 or to, add to negative 24? Negative 8 and 3. All right, they multiply to negative 24, and they add to negative 5. So that's the number I wanted to look at. So then I'm going to rewrite my equation. Got this extra little mark down there. Hold on. So then I'm going to take my equation using these two numbers, negative 2x squared minus 8x plus 3x, because this negative 8 is right there. The positive 3 is right there. If I were to combine these back together again, they would combine to negative 5x. So really what it is, I took this middle term and split it into two items. All right, the negative 12 is still there. It just doesn't go away. Equals 0. So in this case, I'm... I'm Factoring by grouping. So when I'm solving this, I'm actually factoring by grouping first, and then I'll solve. Once I get, again, we start out, there is no greatest common factor. That was always step one. Step two is, all right, if, if the first number is one, I can look to do factoring right away. But the first number is a two. So I go two times negative 12, negative 24. And then I look for numbers that multiply to negative 24 that add to the middle term, which was negative 5. And then I split that middle term into those two values, the negative 8 and the positive 3. And now I've got four things. I'm going to look at these two. I'm going to look at these two. And I'm looking for each of those. So the factor by grouping means I kind of split it apart, and then I take the first group. And I say, okay, negative 2x squared minus 8x. Can they both be factored by something? Is there a number that divides out of negative 2 and out of negative 8? Negative 2, because they're both even. And they both have an x, you're right. So I'm, what I'm doing there is, again, I'm doing reverse distributive property. Doing reverse distributive property. And when I do that, when I do that, I divide negative 2 out of this negative 2. That'll be 1. I divide 1x out of that x squared. 
leaves me with x. Now, if you're not sure what's going on there, I can do it over here. So what I really did is I did negative 2x squared divided by negative 2x. So that's factoring is reduced, is, is dividing. Factoring is dividing. And when I do that, I go negative 2 over negative 2. Well, before I do that, I look and see this is only multiplying and dividing. There's no adding and subtracting going on here. So negative 2 divided by negative 2 is 1. x squared divided by x, x. So that's why I'm left here with just 1x. Negative 8 divided by negative 2x. Be positive 4. Negative 2 over negative, sorry, negative 8 over negative 2 is 4. And then x over x is 1, leaving me just x plus 4. Again, if you're not seeing that, I took the negative 8x. I divided it by the negative 2x, my common factor, my GCF for those two things. Negative 8 divided by negative 2 is 4. x divided by x is 1, so I have 4 times 1, which is 4. Here, do they have a common factor? 3. When I divide the 3 out of the 3x, I'm left with x. When I divide the, something's not working out here. Did I miswrite a negative? Oh, yeah. See? Got to correct me up here. This is a 2, not a negative 2. I'll go back and fix that quick. So this is not a negative 2. So this is not a negative 2. So that middle parenthesis, this is minus 4. So then back over here, divide the 3 out of the 3, 3 out of the 3x, I'm left with x, divide a 3 out of the negative 12, that's negative 4. The reason why I knew I did something wrong is if I did factor by grouping the right way, when I get to this place, whatever this is will be the same in both groups. Now, since they both have this same thing, I am going to factor that out, or in essence, divide by x minus 4. So x minus 4 comes out in front. This reduces, leaving me with 2x. These reduce, leaving me with plus 3 equals 0. And now I'm about 80% of the way there. I've just got one more thing to go because I need to solve. Anytime it says solve, that means there was an equal sign, which means when I'm done, I'll, I'll say, well, x will equal this value or possibly this value. So now I've got these two things, two parentheses sets that multiply to give me 0. And if you think of any two numbers that multiply to 0, if I have a times b equals 0, then either a is 0 or b is 0. Those are the only two ways you can multiply to get to 0, which means either this is 0 or this is 0. And if you can't see it just right away off the top of your head, then just write it out. x minus 4 equals 0. That's that first parenthesis he said. Add 4 to both sides, x equals 4. That's one possible solution. Then I take the other one, 2x plus 3, which was this other parenthesis set here. When will that be 0? Well, subtract 3. 2x equals negative 3. Divide by 2. x equals negative 3 halves. And if you remember back, way back, if I were to graph that equation, this one, if I did this as y equals 2x squared minus 5x minus 12, what I just did by solving is when x is 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, and when x is negative 3 halves, which is negative 1 and a half, those are the two places that the graph will cross the axis. And that graph is going to go down here and come up. It's going to be a parabola. That's what solving does when we solve a quadratic equation or a trinomial 
with x squared, it's finding the zeros. One zero is at four, the other one's at negative three halves. Because it's called a zero, because if I put the numbers in, it gives me zero as an answer. But it crosses the x-axis, so the coordinates of that point is four comma zero. Negative three halves comma zero. That's why they are called zeros. So everything we're doing is all connecting algebraically to graphically when we're solving these equations. Right, so now, and again, we're just doing a couple of these quick review questions as before we roll into new content because the next exam isn't going to be that far away. So here, if we're going to factor... I'm also looking to say, all right, well, there's no equal sign, so I'm not going to be solving. So all I'm going to do is factor. First step in factoring is always what? Greatest common factor. Do they all have something that they can be divided by? 3, 5, 6, and 10. Do not have any common factors x cubed, x squared, x, and no x's. Also, no common factors. This is not a quadratic, so I'm not going to be using those methods, but I do have, well, a couple groups so I can try for grouping. And see what happens if I group those together. Do 3 and 5 have a common factor? No, they don't. Do x cubed and x squared have a common factor? Yes, they do. They can both be divided by x squared. I'd be left with 3x minus 5. Again, just factoring out an x squared from the cubed leaves me with 1x. x squared from an x squared leaves me with no x's. Do these have a common factor? Sure. 6 and 10 are both divisible by 2. When I do that, 6 over 2, that's 3x. Negative 10 over 2 is negative 5. Can I do more factoring? Absolutely. They both have this exact same parenthesis set, which means I'm going to factor, basically take this and pull it out in front of both of them, 3x minus 5, I'd be left with x squared plus 2. I have another squared. Can this be factored? All right. Is there a GCF? No. Is this one of the special kinds of uh, trinomials that we've been looking at. So the special kind, the only really one we spent time looking at is difference of squares. Again, difference of squares. X squared minus 9 is a difference of square. It would have factored into X plus 3 and X minus 3. X squared minus 64 is a difference of squares. X plus 8 and X minus 8. At this point, I've said this so many times. If you don't recognize that right away, you're going to be missing a lot of points on the next exam. It will show up in several of the problems for difference of squares. But this is adding. So it's obviously not a difference of squares. It's adding of things. And that's not something squared. So the answer would be no. That cannot be factored any more than it already is. If this all got factored out and then I still had x squared minus 4, I would still be able to factor that into two parentheses, but it's not that. So that's as far as we'd be able to go on that one. So that's enough for review. Now we're going to go into what's next. So first thing first, quick turn with your partners and find the square of each integer from 1 to 12.
just hearing what I hear kind of being mumbled around from group to group to group, finding the square of each integer from 1 to 12. Now do this. Find the square of each integer from negative 12 to negative 1 and then 0. Go. What is negative 12 squared? 144. Why isn't it negative 144? Negative, negative times a negative is a positive. Then why, if you plug this into your calculator, does it tell you it's negative 144? Because your calculator is wrong. If you type this into a calculator, what your calculator sees, because remember, a calculator has to have a certain system in place, it sees the negative 1, the, sorry, the negative 12. Why is that not? There we go. It sees the negative 12 as negative 1 times 12. So if I do negative 12 squared, this is what your calculator sees. It would see it as negative 1 times 12. When it's like this, that means that negative 12 is times negative 12. Negative times a negative is a positive. All right, so then, then 121, oh, I don't know why I switched colors there, 100, 4, 1, and 0. All right, so a negative number squared, positive, positive number squared, positive. So then, kind of what we talked about just a little bit earlier, go ahead, solve these based on what we just talked about. Discuss with your partner as you make those solutions. So I'm hearing some people say, well, something times itself that's 25, which we just did. 5 and negative 5, because negative 5 times negative 5 is also 25. Others I heard say, well, is this where we can do the square root of both sides? The answer is yes. Oh, I'm right on the edge of my screen here, so everything's not. There we go. Come on, square root of both sides. And then the answer would be x equals 5 or x equals negative 5. I heard someone say x equals plus or minus 5. This is the shorthand way of writing this. But when I have something squared and I take a square root, there's going to be two answers, both the positive number and the negative number. So with that being said, what are my answers here? Here? Okay. And if you write x equals plus or minus 11, that's okay too. Now I need to know two numbers that multiply to negative 4. There are no answers. There's no real numbers. So while just on the fringe of this class's scope, negative 4, I could rewrite as the square root of negative 4, or sorry, square root of 4 times the square root of negative 1. All right, you could break it up like that. And then what's the square root of 4? 2. What's the square root of negative 1? I heard it. I. I. If you've never heard that one before, welcome. The square root of negative 1 we define as the imaginary number I. And the only reason why we call it an imaginary number is because all the other numbers previous to this discovery were called real numbers. So an imaginary number was something that's not a real number. Now, Imaginary numbers do exist. It's not like your imaginary friend growing up. All right. It's an actual thing that does exist. It shows up in real life mostly when you're talking about uh, electricity. Uh, so electrical engineers will work in the what's called the complex number system. Um, if you decide to pursue a career in mathematics, you'll also do complex variables, complex 
basically complex numbers within calculus. They do exist. It's just for our sake, we just call it i. And since this would be x equals 2i or x equals negative 2i, because the square root of 4 is plus or minus 2. So plus or minus. But that's what the square root of negative 1 is. Square root of the negative 1 is the letter i. And it just means there will be an imaginary number. Remember back when you did the quadratic formula? Does anybody remember the quadratic formula? And this is if you had an equation ax squared plus bx plus c equals 0. Remember that first question that we did today to start us out with? 2x squared minus 5x minus 12 equals 0. We could have used this formula to do it by taking the values of a, b, and c. This is a, this is b, that's c. So I'd write x equals negative a negative 5 because the, the b is negative 5. So it's negative negative 5, which if you want, you can just switch that to positive, plus or minus the square root of b squared, that's negative 5 squared, which we said is to positive 25, minus 4 times a, which was 2 times c, which is negative 12, all over 2 times a, which is 2 times 2. This number inside will be a value that we can actually take the square root of. But if this number, and again, if you've had time and you've done the quadratic formula before, there are some times when this number, b squared minus 4ac, if it's negative, the whole thing, I'd have the square root of a negative value. And then you were trained to say, way back in the day, there are no real roots, which is true. There are, however, two imaginary roots. And that's where the uh, complex number system starts to take shape and form when you start realizing that you can graph imaginary numbers on a graph like we do for regular geometry. But that's not where we're going today. We're going to go to this next. If I have the square root of negative 7 squared, square roots and squaring are inverse operations. This answer would be negative 7. All right. Again, when I have a square root of something that's squared, and the only thing, or I should say if everything is squared, the square root and the square are inverse operations, they eliminate one another. But not all the problems are like that. Now I've got this, square root of 0 0.09. Your instinct is to go to your calculator, which is fine, you could recognize, though, that the 3, 3 squared is 9, and it's 0 0.09 squaring, square rooting, moves the decimal one place for me. I don't know how I turned it to yellow there. It would be 0 0.3. Again, if you could, that's a simple enough one. If you just jump to your calculator, that's fine. But you could, might get in the habit of doing this and seeing squares and square roots. All right. So now I've got x to the fourth. What multiplies by itself to give me x to the fourth? Has to be the exact same thing. X squared. All right. Or negative x squared. Now, if you're not seeing that, what I'm saying is, if I take this negative x squared, I go negative x squared times negative x squared. Negative times a negative is a positive x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. All right. This next one, my bullets didn't have a lot of space, is one giant one like this. So that's all one problem there. So I've got the square root of 4 over the square root of 9. Square root of 4 is going to be either 2 or negative 2. Square root of 9 is going to be 3, 
or negative 3. So my answers will either be 2 over 3 or negative 2 over 3. Because if I go 2 over 3, 2 over negative 3, those are the two answers. Negative 2 over 3, that's this one. Negative 2 over negative 3 is this one. Here I have the two square roots separate. Here I have them together. So here's a little property principle. If I have two values under one square root, I can say it as this is the same thing. So square roots can be split up when multiplying or dividing. It's the same thing here. If I have a times b, I take the square root of that. That will also be the square root of a times the square root of b. What I cannot do, if I have the square root of a plus b, I cannot make that the square root of a plus the square root of b. So square roots can be split up for multiplying as long as you're only multiplying. Square roots can be split up for dividing if you're only dividing. Square roots cannot be split up for adding and subtracting. So with that said, the next one down is going to be the same answer. Plus or minus 2 thirds. Square root of 9 times the square root of x squared. Any guesses or logical conclusions if you know the answer? Three times x. Plus or minus 3 times x. Yes. So again, when we're taking the square root of something squared, make sure you always include that plus or minus. So this would be 4 times the square root of x to the fourth. Square root of 9 times the square root of y to the sixth. In the numerator, we did that one already. Plus or minus 2x squared. In the denominator, it'll be plus or minus 3. But now you're going, what two things multiply to y to the sixth? What will my exponents have to be for both of those? If I want them to be y to the sixth. They have to be positive. They have to be the same number. Gets back to the principles of multiplying. When I multiply same bases, I add exponents. So here, when I take the square root, a common mistake is people say, oh, it's the square root of 6. No. Here I said x squared and x squared is x to the 4th y cubed and y cubed is y to the sixth. I'll show you in just a minute about why that is. But that's how that would simplify. Going to pause. The cubes are the numbers 1 through 5. What's 1 cubed? Just shout it out. 1. What's 2 cubed? 8. 3 cubed, 27, 4 cubed, 64, and 5 cubed, 125. The reason why I'm only going up to 1, 2, and 3, and 4, and 5 is those are going to be the most common cubes you're going to see. Anything beyond that, I would not expect you to, you know, even recall. Um, probably the, the most common ones you'll see on any kind of a math test or even a future science exams that you might have to do anything with cubing are going to be 8 and 27 for numbers that can actually be cube rooted. And now, what is the cube of negative 1? 
negative 1. What's the cube of negative 2? Negative 8. Negative 3 cubed? Negative 27. Right, because you have negative times negative times negative. All cubes, if the base is negative, my answer is negative. Negative 4 cubed, that's a 3. Negative 64, negative 5 cubed, negative 125. So then, if I have the cube root of 8, what will that equal? Two. Number times itself three times. Two times two times two. That's eight. Cube root of negative eight. We just did that. That was negative two. Negative two times negative two times negative two. Once we spend so much time on square roots and we get to say, oh, we can't take the square root of a negative number, then we go to cube roots. Our instinct is to say, oh, you can't take the cube root of it. Oh, no, you can. All right. I can take a square root, cube root, fourth root, fifth root, any numbered root of a positive number. I can only take an even root of a negative number and get a real number. I can take the fourth root of 8 and get a value. Now I'd have to use my calculator. But if I try to take the fourth root of negative 8, that there's no real number for that one. So even numbered roots. But even numbered roots, uh, we're going to skip that for now. We're going to go back to this. They're all kind of crammed in here. So this is what's going on. Square roots can also be written as exponents. The square root is the same as the root to the one-half power. So this, these would be identical ways of writing the same thing. Square root of 5 is the same thing as saying 5 to the one-half power. The fourth root of 5 is equal to 5 to the one-fourth. So square root has a little 2 there, even though we don't normally write the 2. Fourth root, rewrite it. So it's 1 fourth power. The fifth root means I would take all of this inside, so the 4x minus 1 squared, and I'd do the whole thing to the 1 fifth power. And then here it's a matter of going, oh, wait, I have powers raised to powers. I have something to the squared power, right? This is squared. So this whole thing I'm treating as just one thing. The square cannot come into these individual ones because there's subtracting. Just like when we factor, you cannot factor individual parts. We can't bring the square in on individual parts. All right. So this whole thing is squared. So that's like an A squared. I'm calling this A squared to the one-fifth power would be a to the squared to the one-fifth. Powers raised to powers multiply. So it'd be a to the two over one times one over five, which is a to the two-fifths. Which is why this here is 4x minus one to the two-fifths power. And that's as far as you could simplify that. So the negative power is 1 over 6 squared, just a refresher on negative powers. So that's going to be 1 over 36. So now we're going to some examples. I'm just going to kind of blow this up. We'll look at that first one up there first, so it's a little bit larger. So we're going to do the distributive property on this first one. So I'll have z to the 2 thirds times z to the 1 third minus z to the 2 thirds times z to the negative fifth. Remembering properties of exponents, when I have the same bases, they're both bases z, and multiplying, I 
add exponents. So that first would simplify to z to the 3 thirds. Minus, same bases, and multiplying, I add exponents. 2 thirds plus negative 5, if you have to. Write it like that. And then go, what well, now I need common denominators. So negative 5 is the same as negative 15 thirds. Then I add. That would be z to the negative 13 thirds. z to the 3 over 3 is z to the first. Minus z to the negative 13 thirds is 1 over z to the 13 thirds. Negative exponent means it goes in the denominator. This whole thing flips to the bottom side of a fraction then. Since now, a common mistake people are going to make right here is they're going to try to combine these two, saying, well, they're both z's. But I can't combine them when they have different exponents. It's taking us back, and it's really a more complicated view of this. x squared plus x, they cannot add together because the variables are different variables. It's the same thing going on here. They're different bases, or sorry, their bases are the same, but since their exponents are different, they cannot combine, just like we cannot combine those two. Look at this next one. All right, what do we have going on here? The parentheses are there to demonstrate that I have two things that are being multiplied. I'm going to either do a double distributive property or FOIL. For those that recall, I have two binomials being multiplied, first, outside, inside, last. So I go firsts, x to the 1 third times x to the 1 third. Those are the firsts. First times first. Outside, x to the 1 third times 2 is going to be 2 times x to the 1 third. When given a choice and you're multiplying a constant times a variable, put the constant in front. It just it feels better. If you go x to the 1 third times 2, it just doesn't look right. Putting those numbers out in front. Insides, negative 5 times x to the 1 third is negative 5 times x to the 1 third. And then lasts, negative 5 times 2, negative 10. I'm going to go here and just start doing some simplifying x to the 1 third times x to the 1 third, same bases and multiply, I add the exponents. That'll be x to the 2 thirds. I have x to the 1 third, x to the 1 third. They're the exact same variable. So I can combine those, 2 minus 5. Negative 3x to the 1 third. And minus 10. At that point, I would be done simplifying because this exponent is different than that exponent, so they cannot combine. These two could combine negative, or positive 2 and negative 5 because their variable is identical, x to the 1 third, x to the 1 third. Square root of 5 times square root of 5 should be square root of 25. I don't know where the square root symbol went. Which equals 5. Why don't we say negative 5 on this case? Because my original part was not negative underneath. With that being the case, I could do the same thing here. That would be the square root of 20. Or 
What's the square root of 4? 2 times the square root of 5. Which on the last couple of slides today, we're going to go through uh, simplified radical form. And that will become the preferred way of writing our answers. So in this case, this is our preferred way of writing our answer. When I have that fourth root, I'm going to rewrite this as x to the fourth, y squared, over 16x to the eighth, all to the one-fourth. Be careful down here. That power is only on the x. It's not on the 16. How do I know that? Because if, there, if it were on the 16, there would be parentheses. It's only on the 8. All right. I have multiplying in the numerator. I have multiplying in the denominator. There's no adding and subtracting. That allows me to bring my exponent in. And I have powers raised to powers... Powers raised to powers multiply. I'll have x to the one uh, x to the fourth to the one fourth. I'll have y squared to the one fourth. I will have sixteen to the one fourth. And I will have x to the 8th to the 1 fourth. I could have also done this over here. 4th root of x to the 4th y squared divided by the 4th root of 16x to the 8th. And then I could have rewritten that numerator as the fourth root of x to the fourth times the fourth root of y squared over the fourth root of 16 times the fourth root of x to the eighth. And then from here, that's identical to what I have here. x to the fourth to the one-fourth, y squared to the one-fourth, 16 to the one-fourth, x to the 8th to the 1 fourth. This way or this way are both going to get you to the same place. And honestly, I don't care either way you would go about doing it. So whichever one, like, I, if you just look at this down here and say this makes more sense, do it like this. If you are up here saying this makes more sense, then do it like this. If you have some other method that doesn't get you to here or here, then you're doing a wrong thing and don't use that process. Powers raised to powers multiply. 4 times a fourth is 1. X. Powers raised to powers multiply. 2 times a fourth is a half. 16 to the fourth power. Do I know a number that multiplies by itself to get 16 if it's the same number 4 times? 2 times 2 is 4, times 2 is 8, times 2 is 16. 2 times 2 times 2 times 2. So my answer here is 2. Powers raised to powers, 8 times 1 fourth. 8, well, it's, again, 8 over 1 times a fourth is 8 over 4, which is x squared. And then I can reduce this with this. That would be left with y to the one half over two x. Y to the 
Jo. As you're thinking about prepping for that final exam, you're thinking, all right, we've done a lot with exponents, properties of exponents, same basis the exponents add, powers raise to powers they multiply, remembering that you cannot bring exponents in. If this had been squared above this parenthesis set, that squared does not come onto each of those. And we know that because we've done a lot of problems. You know, x minus 3 squared is the same as saying x minus 3 times x minus 3, which if we multiply that out with foil, it would be negative, it would be x squared minus 6x plus 9. And the mistake people make is they go, oh, it's going to be x squared minus 9, which is not what that is. So exponents cannot come in to parentheses if there's adding and subtracting. Similar to what we did when we factored and reducing, unless the identical parentheses set is the numerator and denominator, they can't individually reduce. What about this? Can they be combined? Nine squ uh, square root of nine is nine to the one half power. Eight to the uh, cube root of eight, I should say, is eight to the one third power. Are my bases the same? No. If bases are same, I cannot combine. The only time I can combine is when I have same bases. Same bases and multiply, I add exponents. I have different bases. I could also say and look, well, what is the square root of 9? 3. What is the cube root of 8? 2. For an answer of 6. Um, so I'll be emailing out then later today a, a document that has some uh, example type problems for the, for the next exam. Um, as I said with the first exam, I still got another couple slides here to go, but I just don't want to forget this. Um, I don't typically make full giant review packets. Um, the problems that I assign and the check your understanding, that's usually where I go back and take my exam questions from. So if you've done all those and make sense to you, that's where a lot of those questions come from. Um, some of the exam questions that are going to be in the review sheet that I send you are problems off of your assigned problems anyways. Um, there's reasons why I pick the problems that I pick. I don't just willy-nilly choose some out there and hope they're good. I try to go through and only get, pick out the good ones. Um, because there's, I mean, I could just give you all the odds. That's a lot of problems in a math textbook. Uh, but I'll, I'll do this other one just as a quick reminder to kind of draw your attention. And then if you don't know how to do them, obviously, then you're jumping back into your textbook. You're jumping back into um, every video I've created for every lesson on how to do these types of problems as well. And then if still not there, um, using Khan Academy and other online resources, there's a bunch of places you can go and get online help or your friends and myself. But let's go on. Simplified radical form. Uh, this is the process by which now if we end up with an answer like this, um, I do not want decimal answers unless I say, write your answer to the nearest tenth. If I tell you that, then by all means, use your calculator and find the square root of 24. But instead, what we're going to do is we're going to do what's called simplified radical form. Um, many of you in the past have done factor trees. So a factor tree was if I take a number like 100... Now let's take a different number, 64. You're like, oh, what two numbers multiply to 64? All right, 4 and 16. What two numbers multiply to 4? 2 and 2. And then those are done because they're prime numbers. And then 16 is 8 and 2. And then 8 is 4 and 2. And then 4 is 2 and 2. And then we're left, oh, it ends up being all 2s. But that would be what's called a factor tree. The idea is going to be this similar, except that when I'm picking two numbers, 
that multiply to the square root of 24, I want to pick it so that one of them, I know the square root of it. So then you, this is where having your multiplication tables is helpful. And you go, what two numbers? Because you could say, well, 12 and 2. 12 and 2 technically multiply to 24, but I'm not going to choose them. Because I do not know the square root of 2, and I do not know the square root of, know the square root of 12. I'm only going to pick a number if I know the square root of it. So I would choose 4 and 6. The reason why I choose 4 is because I know the square root of 4. Their square root of 4 is 2, and then that tree branch ends. And then I say, okay, the square root of 6. Do I know two numbers that multiply to 6 where one of them I know the square root of it? So you can even draw this and say, all right, square root of this and square root of that. What numbers multiply to 6? Well, 1 and 6. That doesn't help me because 6, I still don't know the square root of it. I know the square root of 1, but then still left with the square root of 6. I could choose 2 and 3, but do I know the square root of 2? No. Nope. Do I know the square root of 3? No. Nope. That's why we started out today. 1, 4, 9, 25, 36, 49, all the squares. It's neither of them, so the square root of 6 is done. It cannot be simplified in radical form. So the square root of 24 gets rewritten as 2 times the square root of 6. Let's do another one. Square root of 28. I want to pick two numbers where I know the square root of one of them. What two numbers multiply to 28 where you know the square root of one of them? 7 and 4. Since I know the square root of 4, it is 2. So I'm not, see, I'm not splitting up the 4. I just know the square root of 4. It's 2. Done. Write it as 2. 7 is prime, which means it's also done. So I'm left with 2 times the square root of 7. 50. What two numbers multiply to 50 where I know the square root of one of them? 50. If you need to, write your squares down. 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, 4 squared, 5 squared, 6 squared. That's 7 squared. Do any of those numbers go into 50? 25. The square root of 25 is 5. That's why I chose it. Square root of 2, 2 is prime, done. This in simplified radical form is 5 times the square root of 2. So moving forward, if we're doing square roots, if unless I ask, specifically say, round answers to the nearest tenth, hundredth, etc. You'll do them as simplified radical form. Right. If you're doing the uh, online chapter, or sorry, exam two review, again, you can do it as many times as you want. There, if I'm asking for numeric answers, then I say round to the nearest. If I say something like round to the nearest tenth, I'll put in parentheses, you know, point 0.1. As a reminder, that means one decimal place. If I tell you to round to the nearest hundredth, I'll usually put in parentheses 0.01 as a reminder that that means the nearest two decimal places. All right.